Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. We appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for coming. We, of course, are in Isaiah. So I hope you have your binders because Josiah is up there doing great things. So we will leave them alone. We're uh, going to begin with a prayer. so thankful for everything that you do for us, all the blessings you bestow upon us, Father. Pray that you will continue to do that. Father, we pray for those that uh, can't be here with us, that are sick and, and grieving and afflicted in spiritual ways. Father, we pray that you will be with them and comfort them. And, and we pray that you will guide us in what we can do to help them. Father, we uh, are so thankful for your son, Jesus, fact that he came to this earth and sacrificed himself for us, Father, that we have a hope and promise to be with you. And Father, now that we go and, and into the study of Isaiah, we pray that you will be with us. We pray that our hearts and minds will be attuned to the messages that are contained there. And Father, we pray that all that we do is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. The charts that are in the beginning of your book. Something I want to point in your head. Anne reminded me to do this. Thank you, Anne. As we go through these charts now, we're really superficially looking at them. We're not doing them in detail. Therefore, you're learning, so I would expect you to look more detailed at them at home as you're studying Isaiah. But as I'm in the text, which we hope to start next week if I can get my act together, Maybe the week after. As I'm in the text, some of these charts will be pertinent to what I want to do. And so, let's see if Josiah did something for me. No. What did you not do, Josiah? Do I need to put it on slideshow, I guess? So I just used the laptop to move both? Ah, looky there. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I'm fascinated. I'll put this away. Thank you. You can put it on slideshow as well, full screen. I can put it on slideshow. Yeah, if you want full screen. Yeah. If you want full screen. Yeah. You can do it on, on your computer. On your computer. You want full screen? On, on your here. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> See, you have to retrain me every time we do something. Ah, yes. Oh, no, no, you lost it. Yeah. Well, maybe. Maybe not. It's a miracle. <laughs> For me, it is. <laughs> well, Lee, for Josiah, it's just a day's work. For me, it is a miracle. All right, so let's go back to Isaiah and these charts. These charts are meant for your learning. I want us to use them, but as I get caught up in the text, as we get into the text, I guarantee you I won't remember what chart and I won't remember to go back to it. So what I'm asking from you is that if you remember a chart that pertains to what we're talking about in the text, tell me, tell us, and we'll go back to it and review it and have some things going on, but I'm still on mute. I got too many things to worry about. <laughs> All right, now you can hear me, right? Okay, so let's start with who was Isaiah? He's a prophet. A prophet of God. A major prophet because of what? The amount of words he spoke. Yeah. And the amount of years he did. What? But Haggai, Habakkuk, has more words than Daniel. Yes. And unfortunately, he's a minor prophet. <laughs> yeah, so it, doesn't it doesn't always hold true, but men have named them. God didn't. So we won't expect them to be right all the time, will we? No. All right. The one that we're looking at here, Isaiah 
means what? The Lord saves. But this is a prophecy of discipline. So how does it say the Lord saves? Okay, he's going to spend a lot of time on whom in his book? The Savior. The Savior, the Messiah, doesn't he? And he does it in what I call types and shadows, or some people call figure and letter. Now, what in the world are those two things? All right. There is something. Yes. You can't hear her. Speak up. Like Believe me, when she's yelling at me, you can hear her. <laughs> it's like a dim mirror. When you wipe it clean, the more you wipe, the clearer the image becomes. All right. There is something called a duality of Scripture. I want to make sure we have this up front. Because if we don't get it up front, we're going to get lost when we get into Isaiah. What, is I, what do I mean by the duality of Scripture? Yes, Rochelle. Do you mean applicable then and now? That's exactly what I mean. A Scripture that's written for the purpose of then, but it has a hidden meaning. It's not so hidden sometimes, but to them it was hidden. It's more easily seen by us today because we have the whole picture. We have the big book. So we can look back and see it easier. Yes? Well, a lot of the messianic prophecies that Isaiah did, that back then they didn't understand. Correct. On the other side of the cross, we look back and say, oh, he was talking about Christ. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about types and shadows, duality of scripture, as some call figure and letter. There's there's a system that God has, and it's throughout Scripture, and he makes it clear that this means, yes, this now, but down the road it's going to mean even more to you as a people. Now, when he talks to people, and he talks about something that's not going to happen for 800 years, how in the world does that help them? It gave them hope. Hope in this life? That was one of the things about the prophets. It gave the people hope. And that's the job of the prophets. Okay, so if it gave them hope, what wasn't going to happen in their lifetime, because it was going to be for God's people, what's hope to us? The same thing. The same thing. And what is it God's talking about that's hope to us? Yes. That God is always faithful to deliver. Yes. So we have hope, not like they did in the sense that these prophecies haven't come true. They have. But what is our hope then? God keeps his promises. He's faithful to do so. He's loving and he's righteous to do so. And our hope is the spiritual world of heaven that so much of the Bible has promised. They had a physical many times promise that it would not happen in their lifetime that was way down the road but they could hope for their people to have that is what the type where's the figure where's the shadow where's the letter it's the spiritual application of the church of Jesus Christ of us looking for a home in heaven not a home here a citizenship in a kingdom that's spiritual of nature, not physical, so that we have the same kind of hope they had, only we're looking way past our lives into the life to come. And that's exactly what they were doing with some of the things they had. All right, let's further on to some of the charts. This chart, again, puts the prominent understanding of history in our mind. The one thing I really want us to get in history is there were six major um, empires, okay? When does this take place? Two of the empires. Yeah, the Assyrian, which will take Israel away, and actually the next one, Babylonian, 
will take Judah away. That will happen after Isaiah, actually, into Jeremiah's time. But nevertheless, we need to put this in perspective of where it lands. Israel will be taken away in 721 by Assyria. And what actually happens to the people? Literally, what happens to the people? They're lost. They're taken for away into foreign lands. Now, that isn't totally true with Judah because he took two parts of them. He took them in three parts. Two parts of them went away to Babylon, but one part stayed behind. What eventually happened to that last part? No, they haven't got there yet. The last part that he didn't take away was... Killed. He killed them. They thought they were the righteous ones because God left them behind in the city and they come to find out what? They were the unrighteous ones that God left behind that he was going to actually destroy. The field of them bones that he will have them scattered throughout. But he will give hope. As he asks, can those bones become alive again? And yes, they can. By the power of God, of course. All right. Judah only will be taken away at the beginning of its captivity in 606. Another section about 30 years later and then the last one destroyed. Totally. That isn't quite 30 years. 30 years is for the whole thing. All right. So as we move on then, this is the map. Does this still work? Probably. Yes. Only it's green. How did it get to green? Who knows? Assyria. Aram, Babylon. At the beginning of Isaiah's prophecy, there are still 12 tribes in Israel, right? 10 to the north, 2 to the south. Aram is still a very strong country. They haven't been destroyed yet. Ahaz and Naaman, we know them. We've been studying them. They were from Aram. But Assyria starts to raise its head, and it conquers Babylon, the first Babylon great empire. Once it does that, it begins to move to the west and conquers Aram, and then over time, it will take whom? Israel. Ten of those tribes. That will leave just two tribes down here in Judah. Now, God is so desperately trying to get Judah to understand that Israel is going to be taken away and use it as an example. Your sister, learn from your sister, he tells them. Did they learn from their sister? They did not. Unfortunately, they did not. And so therefore, over a period of the next 60 or 80 years, God will allow Babylon to come back. They will conquer Assyria. And as they conquer Assyria, they will go down in and take Judah away into captivity. Yes, Brian. The passing part, I thought you might get to it, but God was so intent on making sure that he preserved, you know, part of this lineage of Christ with Judah, that when Sennacherib came down, yes. um, Angel of the Lord killed 185,000 men. So, he did, uh, yes. Just an amazing story there. He told, was it Hezekiah, if I haven't got it wrong? He told Hezekiah that uh, once he repented that they would not be destroyed and he himself god almighty became their warrior and he killed 180 some odd thousand people yes absolutely it's the power of god they saw that power of god and yet they did not what they didn't become faithful they didn't repent they didn't do what god wanted them to they were so mired in their sin they just couldn't give it up Anything we can learn from that? Yes? Does so much of that come from the leadership or just their humanness and not following God? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we will see in, a, in another chart shortly that all of Israel's kings were what? Evil and bad. Evil and bad. Yes. But in Judah's kings, they had many what? There were good and some that were kind of neutral, good and bad. And so they had opportunity. 
their kings actually, some of them, were trying to lead them away from the sin that they had got themselves into. But the people were so mired in that sin and so used to the practice of these things, especially even what? Idolatry. Idolatry. They will not give up idolatry until they come back in the restoration from Babylon. And they will have learned their lesson finally at that point. But the idolatry of the nations around them influenced them so badly that they not only wanted the one true God, God, but they wanted the other gods as well, and they wanted to follow the practices of the other gods as well, who were not gods at all, of course. They were simply idols. All right, I'm getting behind, so I want to ask the same question that Solomon asked. What did he ask? It's not really a question, it's a statement. That which has been is what will be. What did he mean by that? Nothing new under the sun. Under the sun. You got the other part of it, that's right. What is Solomon trying to tell us and that we need to take heed to? That people are weak and they will fall. People are weak, they will fall, and... There's a repetition to us, isn't there? And what's that statement about history? Yeah? That's exactly right. All right. Yes, Brian. I'm just reminded that the same sins that affect us are the same that affected them. Yes. It always falls in those three areas we're told about. Yeah. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eye. Lust of the eye and the pride of life. Every single thing you can think of that's Sinful falls into one of those categories. That's very true. Yes. Well, I think there's a great point there, too, that God is unchanging. Yeah. His will, his law is unchanging. That's right. And our selfishness will always lead us into conflict. That's right. Absolutely. Do we have idols today? What would an idol be for us today? Money. Money. <laughs> Money's an idol. Sure. Power. Power is an idol. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. All of those idols that we actually make for ourselves today, which are not little carved out statues in any way, are they? They're carved out what? In our minds. In our minds. They're carved out things that we want to hold to in our minds. Yes? But there are groups that fall under that category, call themselves Christians, yes. that do have carved images. They do, yes. And God warned Moses about that, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. All right. So that which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. The concept of the understanding is that God's people, even after coming out of Egypt immediately, began to do what? Sin, Sin against God, an idol. What did Aaron say about the calf? You remember what Aaron said about the calf? <laughs> It just jumped right out. <laughs> Although it didn't move after that, I don't understand. I know. <laughs> yes. What, what was his problem? He wanted power. Well, okay. that's what the idol was for, and that's why he went ahead and let the people convince him. But Anne. He didn't have the strength of character to stand up against the, the demands of the people. That's right. And he was embarrassed when he was asked about it. And he just flippantly said something that might be an excuse for him. But really, what has it turned out to be? A bit of a joke, hasn't it? When we read it, don't we all kind of just chuckle? And yet, if we really examined how we got ourselves into some of our sins, and we tried to say it out loud, might some people just chuckle? Well, we might chuckle. You see, we, we sometimes can't even imagine ourselves doing something until we've gotten to the situation where all of a sudden we decide, I'm going to do that. Or I might as well do that, everybody else is. I've already done that. Or I've already done that. Or whatever pressure comes upon us, these things we shouldn't be so lightly to point fingers at others, should we? because sometimes we get caught up in them as well. All right, so what we're going to see with 
the people during Isaiah's time is really what we've seen before, isn't it? And didn't God try to warn them when the very beginning, when they came out of Egypt in Exodus, what is it, chapter 19? Let's look at it. Exodus 19. Who likes to read and can read loudly? <laughs> you got a microphone, I guess it's all right. No hands? Readers? Nobody? Yes, Steve, go ahead. He's coming. We're going to read the first eight verses, it looks like. Yeah. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession for among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Okay, stop for a minute. We'll get the next couple verses. Was there a promise there? And is there a condition to the promise? Yeah. What's the promise? The condition is to obey my voice, and the promise is you'll be my people. Boy, that seems so simple, doesn't it? <laughs> What's the problem with that for mankind as a whole? Yeah. Selfishness. Yeah. You see, we eventually want to make ourselves our own gods, don't we? We eventually want to follow our own will, don't we? We eventually uh, go after our own selfish desires. And when we eventually do that, we are most likely going to disobey God, are we not? Seven and eight. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Okay. got them all together in a group and said, are you going to do this? And what did they answer together as a group? Yes. And what happens after they scatter? Is there anything for us to learn here? There's strength in numbers that are committed to God, isn't there? There really is. And that's the whole concept of the church, is it not? And it's the whole concept of gathering together on the Lord's Day each and every week, is it not? It's what God knows we need. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Brian. I think one of the things I've always struggled with with this particular generation is that they saw some of the most phenomenal miracles yes. that have ever been recorded. Yes. And how that group of people's hearts could still be turned so quick, it, it, it amazes me. It is fascinating. But two things we have to remember. Number one, when they had the ten plagues, how many did they have to suffer in? Just three of them. The last seven didn't affect them. They only affected the Egyptians. And then secondly, when God put these things together and they saw all these mighty works... How much history did they have of going back to idols and sin? They had almost 200 years in Egypt of following their own way. And so even though they saw these things with their own eyes, they were easily swayed back to their old ways. Now, should we be surprised when we sometimes pick up our old ways? We shouldn't be surprised. We just have to know it can happen. Yes? We have in the total word of God, the words of Jesus, the starting of the church, yes. 
the order of the church yes. and God staying and saying, I'll be faithful to you. Yes. One of the famous passages in Isaiah is, let us come together and reason, isn't it? God expects us to reason with him as to the whole story that we have. We, ha we have the entire plan of God laid out perfectly with the end result understanding explained to us. Now, do we sometimes still give it up? Abandon it? Turn our back on it? Yeah, we do. We can. We will. Can the group help us? I think that's one of the things we need to get out of Exodus, that he was trying to tell them. You've come together and you've made a commitment. Now be careful when you scatter abroad by yourselves, because those commitments you sometimes will not keep. All right. He called them in Deuteronomy 32, Jeshuan. Jeshurun, however you want to pronounce it which means my upright ones. What is Deuteronomy 32 really about? It's about the warnings that they were gonna get themselves in trouble with. Were there a lot of them? There were. Do we have a lot of them? We do. There's lists throughout the New Testament, aren't there? about the things that will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Have we or the Corinthians ever participated in those? We have, haven't we? The concept of the understanding I just want us to start off with is God's people sin. True or not true? True. Yes. They sinned then and we of course sin today and we need to make sure that we have the same historical understanding of that that we need to resist our sins in exodus he called them priests and what else we'll find it in first peter chapter 1 verse 9 we are the priests today aren't we priests and the people of god are we them we are them, and we need to have the same understanding that they had. When we go back in history and we get past the time that they wandered in the wilderness and they actually got to go into the nation as God had promised them, their reward of the land, we have the period of the judges. What was the period of the judges like? It was a cycle of ups and downs, wasn't it? They had many judges that God gave them because what? They sinned. And God would bring upon them the nation around them. And when he raised up a judge to get them out of that, they returned to God. The uh, returning to God is happened about every 40 or 80 years. Let's go over to Judges. You can just look at your chart here. I just picked out some of the verses from the judges. There was a repetition of sin in the judges for the people as well. In Judges 17, 6, in those days there was no king in Israel. They haven't asked for him yet. But what happened? Okay. Is that always a good thing? That's usually not a good thing, is it? Doing what's right in your own eyes usually dismisses what's right in whose eyes? In God's eyes. And every man doing what's right in his own eyes is also going to be difficult for what? For other men. Because if you're trying to please yourself, you're probably going against somebody else. Because he has a different idea of what should take place. In Judges 2.11, the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and they served the Baals. What were the Baals? Idol gods of the nations around them. And they forsook the Lord and the the God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. You ever stop to think about that statement? How did they provoke the Lord to anger? They denied him for other gods, and they did sin. What well, it was right in their own eyes, didn't they? Have we ever done that? 
Certainly we have. Do you ever wonder what it's like? Would you like to be standing in front of God at that moment? No. I don't think so. Paul, do you have some? No. No? Okay. So, the idea that they were being righteous was not what was happening, and God was angry. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Asheroth. Now the sons of Israel in 312 again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Again, this is a cycle that takes place. A cycle that takes place for the people of God. They were weak. The sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and 4.1 and Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan. 10.6, the sons of, evil, of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Asherah, the gods of Aram and the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab. What were the gods of Moab like, by the way? You remember? Oh, they made their children walk through the fire. Yes. They had a god named Moloch. And Moloch was to take your firstborn child and sacrifice him. Imagine that in your mind. How evil had they gotten? How had they progressed? 13, 1, now the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines. Now when we start off with David and with Saul, or Saul and David I should say, who's their primary enemy? Philistine. The Philistines. Again, this is a cycle that takes place. A cycle and a chart that you have in your binder. Peace in the land when Israel serves the Lord. Israel does evil in the eyes of the Lord and God punishes Israel with what? With discipline of another nation. Israel cries out to the Lord again and what happens? God raises up a judge in order to bring them back and Israel is delivered. And then it started all over again. In a 40 to 80 year period of time, they did this about 10 times. About a 400 year period. Over about a 400 year period, yes. Does it really change much in Isaiah's day? No. Isn't this what Isaiah is going to deal with? It is. It's exactly what he's going to have to deal with. It's exactly what takes place in the various different... Whoops, I went two. The chronology of the judges in a timeline starts at 1350, goes down to about 950, that 400 years that was just mentioned. And then, of course, we start the kings. Now, Saul was the first king. Was Saul good or bad? Yes. Yes, yes. I like the answer. Yes. Why would, why would you say yes to good and bad? He was very humble in the beginning. I mean, when they wanted to actually finally anoint him in front of the people, could they find him? They couldn't find him. Where was he? He was hiding among the baggage. He didn't know exactly what to do. He, didn't exp he was this big man, heads and shoulders above everybody else, but he really didn't want what they were about to do to him. But what happened to him? He changed Saul started off good, yet he didn't even seek to be king. Yes. But when he changed is when he started to become disobedient, the Holy Spirit left him, yes. became prideful, started trying to get the approval of people yes. instead of God. Right. And that's where David comes into play. And, and Saul was 40 years, David was 40 years, I think Saul was 40 years. And you combine all those together and you, just, you see the transition finally from the, the people mostly becoming more obedient, uh, but yet still sin with David yes. uh, too. So. Yes. So there are some good times, there are some bad times, and there will be some good kings, but there will be a lot of bad kings. Now, why did God allow that? 
okay? In the final analysis of where God was headed, he gave what? He, he gave them free will, did he not? Does he give us free will? Yes. Does he try to influence? How, does he try, how did he try to influence them as a nation? Kings and judges and leaders and Steve? He gave them the law. Yes, right. He also gave them captivity when they were wrong. He gave them discipline. That's right. So what does it kind of sound like when you think about it? A father. It's exactly what it sounds like, isn't it? Isn't God called our spiritual father? Of course he is. And he's called that because this is exactly how it goes with mankind, isn't it? How many of you have raised a teenage child? And how many of you have your hair still? <laughs> when, when a child turns into a Martian, as some people call them, when they turn to be a teenage child, is it difficult? Is it hard? It, it, do they stop listening? Do they have a mind of their own? Do they usually rebel? not true of everybody, I understand that, but it happens. Well, us to God sometimes seems like we're always in our teenage years. We're talking about this thousands of years later, and that's really why I also kind of did this. It's yes. an application of what not to do under the sun, that we're dealing with the same things today. So learn from Saul, and look at it, and figure out why did he do that. Yes. I think it's an interesting time to make a quick point on a slide or two ago. You talked about um, someone who doesn't have something uh, convicted in their, in their own mind that they feel like it's the right thing to do. And even if you go seek counsel and it still violates your conscience, because yes. some ask that, well, what if it violates your conscience? Well, you still have to make a final decision, hopefully reconciling with God first, but if it still does, then there's a, there's a way to depart in, a, in peace. Yeah. And that's really, really important. And you'll see that in these different um, stories, if you will, with people and how they come and go, the way Joshua responded, the way Caleb responded, um, and, and left peace, even though they didn't understand the whole picture, yes. they didn't cause a problem with it. Yes. Sometimes we have to trust, don't we? And we have to trust in what God has planned for us. Yes. Back in Deuteronomy where we were, if we went further, he says, Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Amen. Very good. Chuck, you had something? No? Somebody over here? No? Okay. All right, so the concept of the understanding we need to get in our heads as we start Isaiah is, this is not new. Israel has done this all along, and God sends a prophet at a time of what, usually? At the time of warning at the time of discipline, at the time of judgment. And if you're getting a prophet like Isaiah, and he's speaking these things, why didn't the people hear him? Why didn't they listen to him? They didn't want to hear it. Some listened. Most of them didn't. But we need to remember that there were false prophets saying the opposite thing. Now, if there were false prophets saying opposite of what Isaiah and Jeremiah said, claiming peace, peace, everything's fine, don't worry about it, it's not going to happen, and you would rather believe peace than discipline, who did you believe? Yeah, you believed the false prophets. You thought they were the prophets of God. Now, why didn't God just take them out so they didn't hear such things? Because he gives choice, doesn't he? There's going to be a world in which, well, let me back up and just say what I always say. How many kingdoms are there spiritually? The kingdom of God and Jesus Christ, our heaven, and what's the other kingdom? The kingdom, of Satan. kingdom of Satan. Has God given him the reign to rule his kingdom? He has, hasn't he? Now he has limitations. 
A lot of them we can talk about that go through Scripture. If you can understand Revelation, you can get some of them out of there. <laughs> but nevertheless, there are still just two kingdoms. You're going to be a member of one of them. In fact, we're all a member of the kingdom of Satan until we get out of it with the help of God, aren't we? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we need to remember and understand in their time, just like our time, there are people saying this, and then there are the true prophets of God saying that. And so we have a choice. Which one are we going to believe? Is that still true today? Absolutely, it's still true today. All right, so in the Kings, we have David, we have Saul. One of the things that, uh, oh my, I'm out of time. One of the things that I think is interesting here, this is the time period of Isaiah right here that I boxed out. What happened right before Isaiah? Jonah. What did Jonah go do? Or what did God tell Jonah to do, first of all? <laughs> he said, get over there and talk to Nineveh and get them to repent. And Jonah said, I don't like Nineveh, I ain't going. And so he got on a ship and he got swallowed up by that big fish and he got spit out and he said, okay, I'll go. And so he went. And there he is now. And what happened to the people of Nineveh? They repented. And who are the people of Nineveh? Assyria. Assyria. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? You see, God actually got Assyria to repent for a time. And then another king rose up. And they become the monster. And God uses them as the monster to discipline his own people of ten tribes and to take them away into captivity because they, claiming to be God's people, stopped listening to him. It's not that hard to do. The whole world has done it at some time or another. We are out of time. I'm sorry. We'll get further next week. Thank you. Promise.